Uh, I'm Pete Beckman, and I'm here just to get things started this morning. Uh, and uh, um, really, we're going to dive in immediately uh, these next uh, uh, several hours into really intense tech about the architectures uh, for large systems, for large parallel machines. But I want to offer some advice on the next you know, week and a half uh, or that we're going to be lecturing here. And uh, let me start by just um, uh, giving some, some advice on how to do this course. Okay, so this is a picture uh, from uh, Argentina. My son and I were backpacking there several years ago. And uh, um, if, you, if you go far enough and high enough in the mountains, you get to this wonderful place where there's no cell phone signal. All right? And uh, the great thing about that is that then you can concentrate on other stuff. You can both see the mountains. You can actually talk to humans. Uh, you know, that you might be hiking with. Uh, you can do things other than look down at your device. And so my biggest suggestion initially for you as you get started is resist. Just turn off your mail, turn off your chat clients. The, the amount of time that you're here, uh, again, more than a week, and the number of amazing A1 plus speakers that are here makes this a, uh, you know, uh, a, a venue that is just unparalleled, no, no pun here, unparalleled. And so it is, it is incredible opportunity for you to just look at people and soak in everything you can. Start writing down questions as, while they're speaking. There'll be time for questions, so start writing them down while they're speaking. Take old-fashioned hand notes you know, with a pen and pencil if you need to, or into your laptop but turn off the email and distractions and really just focus. It's way too easy to get sucked into answering email and even compiling code in a window and, and get distracted. So really focus. It will make this week so much, you'll get so much more out of it. So Argon has been doing parallel computing. Uh, this is back in 1953, uh, believe it or not. Uh, they bought their first computer. It was built uh, by physicists. And uh, of course, it's all tubes. And you would toggle in uh, the, uh, the program. And uh, the machine was about 250K, which was a lot of money back then. But uh, to build this sort of calculating machine, this machine was called Avidac. And Argon and the other laboratories have been doing this kind of computing uh, very early on. And the math and computer science department at Argonne uh, has people that, again, were doing this. Uh, this is back in 1983. And you might recognize there are some of these people. Last year, we still had one of the lecturers. But uh, you'll have this year, Jack Dengara. You might recognize him. If you look on the line, online, you might see, uh, uh, recognize him uh, and some others. And they dove into this notion that we really need to start looking at parallel computing. And that was a fantastic change because, uh, it, of course, it's wonderful. It makes the problem a lot more complicated, as you know. Um, but it also opens the door for very interesting architectures. And so uh, right immediately, all the labs, not just Argon, began looking at how can we rearrange computing in various forms in different architectures. So what you're going to get today is a snapshot of what's happening in the field right now with architectures, but also a view into the future. Now, one of the problems with this, and this I used to work at uh, Los Alamos, and uh, the machine up at the right is, the, uh, is a machine that was called the CM5. And it's by almost all these companies went out of business, uh, these first initial com uh, companies that made parallel computers. This one was by a, machine, a company called Thinking Machines. And uh, they used to have the domain name think.com. Uh, now, uh, they lasted a very short period of time. Uh, I think their only real fame is that that computer in the upper right uh, was in the background in the very first Jurassic Park. You know, so that was the, uh, the supercomputer was that, because all those red lights blinked. And so they had that in the background. Um, and one of the problems that people realized very quickly with this pushing the limit on computing is that the architectures change too fast. And what that means, and the person I worked with at, at Los Alamos, he referred to it as the half-life, is that 
if you think about the machine at Argonne or Oak Ridge or, or at Berkeley, they're, they're fielded for only about five years. So that means that on a normal size code, about half of that computer's life is wasted getting the code running and optimized and going, and then you get to use it for a couple years, and then you're already bringing in the next computer. So that means that your investment here, your investment in all of the software infrastructure and tools and libraries and abstractions is really key to be able to move to the next machine rapidly. So this means it changes the way people invest their time and how they write code. So a couple years ago, I gave a talk, uh, it was a dinner talk, and projecting the future about these crazy chips we were gonna have in the future, and here's the picture from 2014, where we would have memory stacked right on the chip, okay? And, uh, and there would be in-package memory. And that's the kind of thing we have now and that we'll hear about in a few minutes. Um, and so we're gonna, in this first morning and, and into the afternoon session, give you some views about what's happening today, but also a little bit into the future, like this. And so if you were here at this talk uh, back in 2014 and you're prepping your code, you might make certain uh, abstractions and changes to say, well, how would I allocate memory such that I could use on package or off package, right? And so these are the kinds of things that there's not, there are no solutions yet. You can't go download a library and back then and, and just solve it, but it's the abstractions and the thinking that you want to do about what could be in your code. How might you structure your code in the future? Now, one of the things today we'll be talking about is quantum computing. Last year we had our first session here that uh, dove into quantum computing, and uh, there is a lot of crazy hype about quantum computing. I mean, if you, if you ever sort of read the, the newspapers about what people, uh, VCs are investing in, it, you know, it's quantum computing, Bitcoin, and machine learning hardware, right? Uh, and, and if you can get all those three in a name of a computer, of a company, you're really golden. Uh, um, I, I, honestly, I saw a thing that was the, the you know, uh, blockchain protocol. It was some, you know, startup that was supposed to do something that wasn't rela really related to blockchain, but was machine learning. And, you know, so these are the hot topics that are happening right now. But there's a lot of actual, a little bit too much hype. And this is actually from a company, this slide here. I'm going to make, I'm going to poke a little bit at them. Uh, this is from Rigetti. And on this slide, which is, uh, was presented in 2016, uh, he says, it's a faster, cheaper path to exascale. Well, okay, right now, quantum computers can't multiply two numbers. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, we're, we're, not, <laughs> that is, we're not on the same time scale. So we're going to have a fantastic quantum computing session, but queue up your questions about what can a quantum computer do and what can it not do. There's a lot of talk about quantum supremacy, what can a quantum computer, what could it possibly do faster, but what could it not do at all? Like, okay, it can't multiply numbers, okay, in the, in the, in the classic sense, right? So queue up some questions, and we're going to have a nice long session on quantum computing, which will be a lot of fun. The other thing that's happening is uh, FPGAs, and we have, a, again, a fantastic session from Intel. Several years ago, it was a surprise to the community to learn that Intel had bought this big FPGA company and suddenly was uh, going to be doing FPGAs. And everyone was like, wow, what? And you know, here's one of the announcements from 2016. And uh, now, when you look back, it's not surprising. And it was an amazing, uh, 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 insightful thing for Intel to do. Over here on the right, is a server that Microsoft deploys. They have about a million of these, and every server that they deploy, that Microsoft deploys, has in the right, in the corner up there in the red box, an FPGA. Every single server that, that Microsoft is deploying has an FPGA in that's doing a bunch of work at the network, at the NIC. Right? So this is going to be even more mainstream and getting a feel for this kind. Again, even though you're designing codes and you, everyone who came here, when you put in your application, you say, I have a code and I have some experience. But now we want to push that a little bit and say, what is the future going to look like? How might you start to change your code? 
Another big change that's happening is uh, computing at the edge. So almost all the time we think about supercomputers over there, right? And we think about very large, uh, and now machine learning codes running over there. But more and more instruments and physics instruments, chemistry, sensing, environmental science, they're moving computation out to where the data is collected, out to the edge. And the reason for this is that the devices that we have, whether it's a hyperspectral camera or an accelerator or a telescope, the devices we have gather way more data than we can possibly save. So uh, even in uh, things like CMS and, and other experiments, physicists would design custom data reduction items. Now that custom data reduction item is a piece of code. And it lives here and then transmits part of the data that's been reduced and possibly done with machine learning to the cloud, and they go back and forth. And we have a project that deploys these, uh, these sensor nodes in Chicago, uh, and we have 100 of them already up. And they're doing computing at the edge. And so now, for if you are, have your badge here, if you're physics or chemistry or environmental science and you have sensors, you probably are going to start seeing this issue that I need to run code along the path. It isn't just that I get my simulation code and I run it in the supercomputer. I might need to run part of that code at the edge. That's another architectural change that you should be looking for. And along with that, as I mentioned, are all the companies that are starting. It's just incredible. Uh, and companies already have products. Uh, Fujitsu announced that they have a deep learning chip. This was a, more than a year ago. Of course, you know about TensorFlow. There's a company in China that has uh, machine learning codes or uh, chips, chips that are designed to do small matrix ops uh, very fast. Uh, there's a whole set of companies, and you'll hear a lot about that this week, but it's, again, something to start thinking about with respect to the abstractions. All right. Now, it's already made it in some of the market. It's kind of fun here. Over on the left, this is something that uh, 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 Amazon just released. It's called Deep Lens, this edge computing concept. And uh, I have one in my office, so here's the one in my office. And uh, it says here, I've got it named here, Pete Hacking, and it's doing face detection. And so it's processing at the edge. Machine learning algorithms are being applied that then detect if there's someone in the room and then sends back not their picture, but just a count, how many people are in the room, right? And Google announced just two days ago, I think three days ago, that they too were working on an edge inference chip, a way to compute at the edge where the data is generated, right? So this is an architectural shift for us. And one of the last architectural shifts I'm going to mention or things that have changed significantly is the fact that we're pushing silicon so far to the edge that it is variable, meaning the things that we get out of the chip, when we want to go use the chip, it's not as fast or it's a little bit slower or it is faster based on uh, uh, its performance is variable compared to the wattage, the, the power that we put in the chip. And this is from a PhD thesis at UAUC just this year. She graduated. Uh, her name was Bilga. And she's analyzing machines and how fast each of the nodes are for doing a particular operation. And you can see this amazing histogram here that the nodes are not running at exactly the same speed. They're, they all vary. And there are other graphs. This is with KNL, the same sort of thing. Now, this is a problem for computer, uh, uh, for people writing code, because it means that load balancing might be important for your app. You might have, if your app is very tightly synchronized, equal work is not equal time. Most every algorithm that you guys have written in the parallel computing, you do something simple. You say, I have this much data. I'll divide it by P. P is the number of processors I have, or N, right? Well, if equal work, dividing it into equal work chunk, is not equal time because of this distribution, maybe you need to start looking at how you do microtasking or changing. So this is a hardware feature that's happening, architectural feature, that is not something that we love, but it's happening because we're pushing silicon all the way to the edge. All right, so some recommendations, and then I'll wrap up here. So during this next uh, few days, but also the whole week, I'm going to really recommend that 
uh, the, the opium crisis here, other people's math libraries, um, is that we really, it's very important that you grab the optimized math library and use it. Don't write yourself a matrix multiply. Please, don't write yourself a matrix multiply. All of the codes have been optimized to run on those architectures. You want to spend some time searching and finding those libraries. Um, embed the parallelism in the messaging. You're going to hear that theme often. Uh, um, and this comes back to the, that half-life thing about how much you have to invest in the software infrastructure. Embedding into your app from the beginning Debugging, performance monitoring, correctness detection, am I getting the right answer, and resilience are key. Several years ago, uh, there was a research team that took a bunch of apps and silently corrupted a couple bits during the run and then sort of asked the apps at the end, how many of the apps could even tell that they weren't getting the right answer? Very, very few of them could tell they're not getting the right answer because they, they wouldn't do back you know, checks. They're things like uh, momentum conserving, right? Or other properties that you know should be the case that even though you do your simulation, you should be able to calculate back and say, does this really make sense? And most apps don't do that. So it's very important as we're pushing the limit that these kinds of things are embedded into your application. There are also two workflow views. There's the science problem and the setup, and then there's the programmer testing modification. And these things have to be considered sort of separately and carefully. And as I mentioned, building an A-plus build system with all of the pieces and slowly evolving into something that does continuous integration is very important. And of course, you already know and have learned about uh, uh, these things. So the last thing is I'll say, over the next uh, uh, several days, as you're looking at the structure and layout and imagining the abstractions for your code, there are a couple things to remember. One is this, uh, the memory issue. That was that picture I showed, the on-package memory. Memory is going to continue to be in a hierarchy. We're just not going to get rid of that, and that hierarchy will grow. It's you know, already extended from on-chip, right? cache, on-chip, off-chip, uh, SD, and then out to object store. And so in your code, addressing that is really important. The second is that, as you saw, heterogeneity is going to explode. We're going to have machine learning uh, hardware all over, FPGAs. We already have GPUs and CPUs. So there's already four things you have to target, right, if you want to do this right. Uh, so start imagining now in your code from the very beginning, how could this module be abstracted in a way that could run on a different piece of hardware, be it an FPGA or, uh, or a machine learning bit. And finally, the fact that equal work is not equal time. And that's going to continue. That trend will continue. And it will it grow, that, uh, that diversion. So with that, we have time for one or two questions. And then the next speaker is getting their laptop up here. Yeah, so the question is, what's on, what does a, a, a machine learning or neural network processor look like? And there really are two different technologies happening. So one is really um, actually, this, this concept has come up, the neuromorphic computing, right? So computing that looks more like the brain. And that is completely different than our, our normal uh, computing. So it's using spike networks and uh, is not doing matrix multiplies. So you should take a look. You have to Google and look up uh, neuromorphic computing at some point. And uh, we have one of those neuromorphic computing chips at Argonne. Uh, and we are testing it uh, in, the, uh, um, in the test bed area. And uh, if you're interested, you can probably ask somebody about it and, and maybe even get an account. Uh, the other is uh, just the optimization of doing the, the uh, machine learning, which are small matrix ops. So they essentially package up, and I don't know if you're going to talk any about it, but they essentially package up all those kinds of operations that you're going to do to build convolutional neural networks and make special purpose hardware that does that, also in reduced precision. So machine learning doesn't need 64-bit precision usually and can do something in reduced precision. Mm -hmm.